It's been a while since we've checked in on my quest to find the best groove boxes, and since the previous installment, there have been some interesting developments. I've tried a bunch of new devices, and I've got some kind of overall observations that can help you and me make some better purchasing decisions. This is the search for the best groove box, part three. <laughs> Also, keep in mind that all of this is coming from the perspective of a 26-year-old hobbyist music producer dabbling in a variety of genres and usually low on time and energy. Your mileage will vary. That being said, let's get into the devices that I've tried since my last Roundup video. The Digitact is an 8-voice monophonic sampler with lots of sound shaping capabilities, Electron's famous step sequencing workflow, a rugged build, and powerful MIDI capabilities. Its particular flavor of step sequencing has very obviously been influential on a lot of other hardware devices that followed it, and I very much understand why so many hardware heads adore this device. But personally, it didn't quite take for me. And even with the addition of a full song mode via firmware update, I didn't find myself drawn to making full songs with it. Depending on how you look at it, it sits somewhere between overpowered drum machine that gives you all the features you could possibly need, or an all-in-one that is, I don't want to say underpowered, maybe an all-in-one that has a slightly unfavorable fiddliness to power ratio. <laughs> I promise they're not all going to be like this, but the Polyend Tracker is another 8-track monophonic sampler, and this takes the Digitax turning samples into synths capabilities quite a bit further, with granular and wavetable engines that often give fairly screechy results. The interface is inspired by tracker software from the 90s, and while that layout is a bit of an acquired taste, if you're familiar with step sequencing, it's not too bad to get your head around. My favorite thing about that layout is the fill feature, which allows you to populate steps with assortments of random notes, instruments, and effects. This last one is especially good for creating IDME glitchy percussion. This is another device that I totally get the appeal of and have even enjoyed using, but it didn't quite gel with the way I normally like to work. But that's not anti-tracker bias on my part because another hardware tracker did gel with the way I wanted to work. The Dirty Wave Mate is, for my purposes, the ideal form of the hardware tracker. I've been asked on occasion to do a full comparison between the Polyan tracker and the Mate, and I don't really think I'm the right person to do an objective, in-depth comparison, but for my money, I much prefer the Mate. This is partially because of the extreme portability that makes it an ideal travel device, partially because of the very clever use of minimal buttons for navigating the interface, and in a large part due to it having synth engines. Having a wide range of solid sounding, very tweakable synth engines on a device that small is, as it turns out, exactly what I wanted in life. And what I've kind of found over the course of this process is that while I enjoy tweaking samples as much as the next hardware head, I really prefer having synth engines to work with as well, at least for the kind of music that I make. This is very pertinent for the next device.
Now that I've effectively settled on my preferred small form eight track monophonic sampler, it's time to very much switch gears to the hulking monstrosity that is the Akai Force. A bit of background, I first really got into hardware with the Novation Circuit and then stayed excited about hardware with the Akai MPC-1. The Akai Force kind of brings together the best of both of those worlds with an Ableton style clip launching workflow sample manipulation engines that are quite refined, and an increasing number of high quality synths and effects. In a lot of ways, the Force is the device that I've been looking for all this time. And I could very well sell most of the gear that I own and just have the Force live on my desk as my daily driver. I still haven't ruled out that possibility, but I do want to be very clear, it's not without its growing pains. As someone coming from the MPC-1, the spread out nature of the Force is pretty intimidating and can be intimidating to get back into after a while of disuse, but that's mitigable. You can get over that. The big reason I can't quite wholeheartedly recommend an Akai device is the jank. Every Akai device I have used feels a little bit like there were multiple teams working on things in parallel without talking to each other, and then all of those features were just slapped together at the last possible second. There's also been a pretty clear preference lately for developing paid add-on content rather than fixing some of those foundational bugs or issues, meaning that building your hardware setup on Akai devices can feel a bit like you're building on a foundation of sand. But to their credit, Akai has been very consistent about keeping their devices updated with both free and paid content. And while they're overpriced, the paid add-on plugins do sound pretty good, especially some of the new stuff like Jura, which kind of helps keep me excited about those devices. And it is nice to see that Akai seems committed to keeping these devices in development, even as other companies like Ableton seem to want to eat a bit of their market share. And Despite that eating of market share, I do think the Force is still relevant, even with the existence of the Ableton Push 3. For people like me who want a clip-based workflow, want to stay standalone for the majority of the process, and then export just to do the last finishing touches in a DAW, the Force is kind of perfect, and I'm starting to worry that I've peaked a little too soon on this overall quest. Because... Despite its downsides, the Force ticks most of the boxes for me in terms of what I've been looking for. The only thing it doesn't have is portability. I did try probably the most portable standalone Akai device, the MPC Live, the original one, and uh, I got a bit of a bad unit. It had not been treated well and deteriorated quite a bit, so I didn't really get to do a fair review of it. But the one takeaway that I do have is that the MPC Live is lighter than the MPC Live 2, which is probably a bit of a better device, and it's still freaking heavy. Like, it's a bit too heavy to put on your lap for a long period of time, and it's definitely too heavy to just throw in a backpack and forget about. So for my own portability needs, it doesn't quite fit the bill. So, okay, let's drop the desire to have a workstation be super portable. Let's let it be big and just live on my desk. Ideally, I would balance out a chungus device like the Akai Force with something super portable that I could really easily fit in a backpack and take with me wherever I go. We're gonna get back to that in a little bit, but first let's talk about a device that I hoped would be that, but it was not to be. The Mark II is Roland's modernization of the SP404, and a lot of aspects of it seem like they would appeal to someone like me looking for a more portable experience out of an MPC-type device. But maybe expecting it to be an MPC-like device was a mistake. It's very much its own thing. Between generations, they obviously made a big effort to make the device more user-friendly, but it doesn't change the fact that the device really seems to funnel you into a particular workflow that is very iterative and very heavily on resampling in order to add effects to stuff, in order to kind of glue sounds together, and in order to build up song structures. That adds friction, and in a bass music context, I'm perfectly fine with resampling sampling because some of it is embracing chaos and seeing where it takes you. On a hardware device like the 404, I have a real resistance to doing as much resampling as it seems to want you to do. Where like, 
If it was the only device I had, I could absolutely make it work and probably even get fast at it and have fun with it. It's very possible I just dug into the device at the wrong point in my life and there's another time where I'd be more amenable to it. But as it is, I found the resampling heavy workflow of the 404 just too fiddly for how I like to make music and it's meant to sound very dusty and I tend to want to make stuff that sounds a little more polished. I just had trouble committing to that workflow and that sound. That's absolutely a me thing. It's an objectively good device, just not one I particularly vibed with. The Electron Syntact was a device that I was hyped for when it was first announced. It seemed to me like they were going to basically take the Digitact and the model cycles, mash them together and add some new stuff. And uh, that's basically what it was. It's a self-described drum and synth computer, which I think is pretty apt, in a Digitact form factor with 12 tracks of a variety of analog and digital engines with things like really punchy kicks hit or miss snares and percussion, uh, some pretty solid synth engines with a mix of harsh FM and a variety of forms of subtractive synthesis. I personally think the device is at its best when it is allowed to be harsh for these gnarly, distorted, industrial type beats or as a tool for hands-on sound design. And in fact, I have harvested many, many kicks, snares, percussion, and synth one-shot sounds that I've made on the Syntact. The thing is, once I started harvesting those sounds, I kind of stopped using the Syntact as a groove box. As it turns out, I like pretty much everything about it. I like the aesthetic. I like the sounds that it's capable of. I like the sound shaping capabilities it has. I just don't really like composing with it. So uh, that's one I decided to let go after I kind of got the sounds I wanted out of it. Overall, I just didn't love the process of actually using it. And besides, I got into electronic music trying to make things like synthwave and monster cat core bass music, if you know, you know. And for that style, uh, the Syntact and its monophonic nature just ended up sounding a bit hollow. And once again, that's a me thing. It's just a bad consumer product fit. And so that's one I ended up letting go. No regrets about trying it though. This little dude back here is an interesting one because unlike the other devices on this list, it's not standalone. This is not the Machine Plus, which is standalone. This is the Machine Mark III, which you do need to connect to a computer to use. But it's very much got a Groovebox workflow, so damn it, I'm including it. We're allowing a bit of workstation to seep into your Groovebox experience. So. The biggest selling point and the biggest downside at the same time is the fact that you have to connect it to a computer because the plus side is that you can use whatever samples and VSTs you want. And I've had a great time doing exactly that, whether it's Serum for the beat that you heard that introduced this section, or it's using Native Instruments own plugins like Playbox. So, hey, that's great. You use your own plugins and you have to use the machine software. That also leads to the biggest downside. You have to use the machine software. It's not egregious, but it's a bit clunky. And I always export the individual tracks from a machine session to bring them into my normal DAW for arranging and final mixing and mastering. And if you thought that editing a MIDI piano roll on an Akai device was a pain in the ass, wait till you try to do it on a machine. I always just reach for a mouse and keyboard at that point. And this is a me thing, but right now I'm running a laptop for everything like normal computer usage, gaming and music production. and. That means there's a couple of extra steps of friction to get this thing connected up and switch out audio drivers and get everything working well. Whereas plugging in a standalone device is just a few fewer steps and I find myself more likely to do it. Once again, that's a me thing, but it is a consideration. I'm at the point where I do still need to dig further into the machine to make a lot more music with it. But just from a cursory glance, I think it absolutely still has its place, even with the introduction of new stuff. If nothing else, but because a secondhand machine is quite a bit cheaper than some of the other all-in-one controller options out there. And speaking of, I've seen a little bit of mention of using the machine with Ableton. If you've done that, 
let me know and let me know if it was a good experience. That's something I'd be very curious about. So where do we go from here? I suppose I should lay out my own goals and priorities for a music production experience. Ideally, I want it to be portable so I can take advantage of inspiration whenever I have the time and energy and wherever I happen to be, and sometimes even in a more like relaxed manner, like on the couch or something. And I want to be able to make music in a way that feels tactile and hands-on, but I also want to go for a very polished aesthetic with my music, something that sounds very cleanly produced with an emphasis on genres like synthwave, bass music, lo-fi hip hop and trap beats, and uh, a little bit of metal. All of this means that I should be seeking out devices that have solid portability, have fairly in-depth sampling and synthesis capabilities, encourage full song creation, and allow for some sort of exporting or recording individual tracks for mixing in post. I'm probably never gonna find a device that ticks every single one of those boxes. The Akai Force ticks all of them but one, portability. It's gigantic, but there is one other device that can now make its triumphant return. Roland MC-101. It's not great for very sample-based production with in-depth sample chopping like you would do for lo-fi hip-hop and other associated genres, but other than that, it ticks all of those boxes pretty well with the recent-ish firmware update that gives you full access to its synth engine. I've been on a bit of a tear lately making some kind of clean sounding synthwave and space wave on this thing. I know that it can be a bit clunky to work with, and of course, I'm not trying to sell you any of these devices, just provide you with my experiences, but I did recently do a video showing how to use the MC-101 as easily and speedily as possible. I'll link it at the end of this one. Also, I've found myself returning a lot more to my laptop because for making stuff like bass music, you need some pretty powerful synths, a lot of them, and probably the ability to stack a lot of effects. And for making some kind of cyberpunk infused metal, I might use a groove box for a bunch of electronic elements and then track guitars and program drums in my DAW. So at this point, while the quest is still ongoing, uh, I've kind of found what I was looking for, especially as I also turned back towards the laptop a bit more, trying to leave behind my era of making stuff that sounds really rough around the edges and trying to take the idea of making really polished sounding music a bit more seriously. But I do want to set expectations here. Full disclosure, over the past year or so, I've had a lower amount of time and energy, I think, than I really ever remember having. I've got professional goals I'm working towards, like everything's going well, don't get me wrong. I just don't always have the time and energy to pour into giving a device the time and energy that it actually deserves to really dig into, really understand, really review properly. And so I want to make sure I'm pacing myself and spending time actually using these devices that I've been lucky enough to accumulate to make music. And I understand that not everyone wants to see that as much as devices themselves. That is perfectly fine. And I've made my peace with that, but there's going to be some ebb and flow on this channel of emphasis on devices, emphasis on making beats. It'll go back and forth. Case in point. This has been sitting in my closet for a while. So for those of you asking me about it, yes, I do have a Synthstrom Deluge in my possession. And no, I haven't taken the time to properly dig into it yet. I just haven't had the time or the energy or the motivation to give this thing a fair shake. I very much want to at some point, but please be patient with me. So that's what I'm having a hard time getting into, but I do intend to get into. Other stuff I might want to maybe try is some of the Sonicware stuff, like the Sample Trek or the Lo-Fi 12, and of course, maybe the Push 3. I'll leave you with a couple of big overarching observations about the Groovebox landscape that will hopefully help you at least make better purchasing decisions. 
first of all, I do recommend you do what I did and take a really good look at both your music production goals and your music production habits and try to tailor your purchasing decisions accordingly. That can include watching tutorials, not just reviews, to try to get a better feel for whether a device kind of fits into what you want or not. I will also say though that a lot of these devices are pretty similar, and there are a few different like archetypes of devices. There is the surprising prevalence of the 8-track monophonic sampler, and all of them are basically the same, and there is the workstation, which are all various flavors of a laptop with music stuff. If you can find a device that is close to what you want, you can absolutely get the rest of the way there with determination and workarounds. And finally, every music production environment is a series of trade-offs. There is a sliding scale of simplicity to complexity, and there are many things that interconnect to tweak where you are on that scale. For instance, the more fine control a device gives you, the more complex the interface gets. And the smaller a device gets, the more complex or even abstract the workflow has to be in order to give you that fine control. And of course, the more features and tracks you add, the more you increase the cost and probably the size. I knew going into this multi-year journey that I would never find something completely perfect, and boy oh boy has that proven to be the case. Once again, that's not to say that you won't be able to find something you really like, because I think that for every type of music producer, there's some sort of hardware device out there that fits pretty close to what they're looking for, but set your expectations going in. If you're new to this whole thing though, you'll notice I didn't make any concrete recommendations. That's because I've already done some videos on beginner recommendations up over here that will hopefully make this whole thing feel a lot less intimidating. And if you want those Roland MC101 videos, you can check this playlist out down over here. Thank you so much for watching and I'll be back with a new video at some point.